Hey, welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Rudy Potenzone from the ITP2 Transmart Foundation and welcome to our September community meeting. Um, today, we're going to cover uh, a few topics, uh, some updates on some of the foundation uh, activities that have been uh, ongoing, um, membership and partnership program, a uh, quick note about the PMCs, and then we have two uh, very interesting presentations for you that will um, give you some uh, some new information on uh, I2B2 releases uh, and the new pro improved process going forward, and then a very interesting presentation by Griffin Weber uh, on some analysis he's been doing on um, papers um, that uh, cover Transmar and I2B2. Uh, so we'll start with uh, our first uh, very important announcement about the annual meeting. Uh, as you know, we've, we've uh, been uh, working hard. The organizing committee has come together and been working on trying to pull together the annual meeting uh, to be held in Luxembourg. Uh, unfortunately, uh, we've had very low uh, registration for the meeting as of this moment. We have only 16 people registered. Uh, the meeting is just uh, a month away. Um, and this includes a number of us from the foundation. So actual attendees to the meeting is, is lower than that. Uh, it's, uh, it costs a lot to run this meeting, it takes a lot of effort by a lot of us. Uh, and We've also not had much response from uh, people who are interested in sponsoring it. Uh, we've had a late start getting this going. We know that a uh, number of, of reasons, um, but um, it's, it's really, you know, we thought we could pull it together in time and, and really get the session the meeting pulled together. We've actually identified some keynotes that I think would be, uh, could be a good um, draw for the meeting. Uh, but as of yet, we've really, not been able to uh, to get the the draw, you know, the people registering uh, and the sponsors. The organizing committee has been working hard, uh, to new different ideas, tried to publicize the meeting, but um, it's just not not really come together. Uh, we're facing a, a deadline from the hotel where we're we're holding the meeting uh, that um, we either have to go forward uh, and uh, hopefully be able to drive all these numbers up and get a good session, uh, or cancel uh, now. And um, unfortunately, we, we believe that the best way forward for us, given where we are today, is to cancel the event. And so as of this time, uh, we're going to notify, uh, we're notifying everyone that uh, we will not have the annual meeting this year. Um, and uh, we'll really put our efforts on putting together our event program for 2018. Uh, we think that in terms of the, the resources of the foundation, uh, to put really a strong meeting together, uh, it's be much better for us to, to just accept this and, and move ahead and really get focusing going forward. Um, we do have uh, a number of things already uh, set up for next year. Uh, the precision medicine meeting uh, at Harvard that we usually have has been scheduled uh, and will take place. Uh, the fall meeting, we've already have agreement from um, E.K. Gao and his group at Imperial College to hold the meeting, uh, the fall meeting. Um, there in October, and we're evaluating a number of, of other ideas, including potentially a spring meeting. Uh, we really want to have another datathon in 2018, a number of hackathons, and we're evaluating, you know, where where do we where should we be as the foundation? You know, what types of scientific meetings should we be attending? BioIT World, molecular medicine meeting, which we've been going to, AMIA, which we we've been attending, uh, and. A uh, number of other uh, uh, potential meetings have come up, you know, ISMB and other things. So we really uh, are taking a hard look at what we want to do next year. We want to put our resources and really put together uh, a strong set of meetings uh, for next year. Um, so that's, um, you know, that, that's the, the, the plan now. Um, I will be getting a note out uh, about the cancellation so everybody knows. Uh, and hopefully not too many, you know, that you, you don't, you know, we've, um, you know, this is early enough in the process that um, you know we can we can um, move ahead. Um, the other thing I would mention, and you know maybe can, uh, you know potentially somewhat of a contributing factor, is that there is the European Academic User Group meeting for I2B2 on October third, um, third and fourth, I think, or second and third, uh, taking place in Paris. Um, they have a, a good session. You know, pulled. I'm oh, sorry, fifth and sixth. They have a good session pulled together with some some very nice speakers and a number of sessions. Uh, and I encourage, you know, anyone uh, to, to consider that. Um, uh, the, the group there has been working closely with us. Uh, we've actually added some Transmart presentations and, and working group to, for the meeting. 
so that um, you know there will be a, a presence of the foundation at the at the session, and we'll also be given you know since this is an I two B two user group meeting, uh, we will be giving some uh, introduction to Transmart. Uh, and Diane Keo and Peter Rice will be attending uh, and available to uh, provide some information. So um, this uh, this uh, will you know this gives uh, an opportunity to um, to see you know and, and have. Uh, the overall foundation presence uh, at this meeting. So, um, as I said, you know we're you know we're, we're all sad to to have to make this decision, but um, we think this is the best way um, going forward. Okay, so um, Keith Elliston is going to come on now and talk about the membership program. If I unmute him, there he goes, Keith. Okay, <clears throat> thanks, Rudy, and uh, thanks for that overview on the annual meeting. I think the uh, the key thing for us is to make sure we're focusing foundation resources on things that are impactful for our community um, in doing that. So uh, I'm sure that you'll, you'll work things out as we as we continue to develop a, a marketing program uh, and plan around this. In terms of the, the membership program, we sent out uh, things uh, last month uh, around nominations for new members. We had, uh, I think this last, was it two weeks ago, was it now? We had our, our introductory call on this. Um, but the, the opportunity now is for uh, current members of the foundation, uh, there are about 50 of them, uh, to nominate uh, new members for the foundation. And this is a very important aspect, again, because uh, we are now driven uh, by, by individual members. Uh, individuals make up the membership, and uh, the membership makes up the board of directors. We have two key activities that take place. Um, uh, in the year. One is the nomination of new members and an election for those new members. Uh, and the other is in the fall, uh, where we have, I'm sorry, in the spring, where we have uh, a nomination for new board members and an election of those new board members. And this is the way the governance model for the foundation renews itself. Um, so the key thing I wanted to point out is that uh, it, it's only been, I think, two weeks. This will go until uh, the uh, first week of October. Um, but we've received uh, three nominations uh, so far. Uh, those three nominations are for uh, developers that uh, can, are committers to the ITB2 code base. And I would like to encourage people that uh, would like to nominate someone to be a new member uh, to do so. I believe October 9th was the close date. Is that correct, Rudy? No, it's October 13th, actually. That's yeah, on the slide. Uh, uh, well, I guess if I read the slide, I'd, I'd know it. Uh, October 13th is the closing date. So. Again, I'll point out that uh, existing members uh, can uh, nominate new members and will participate in the election to vote for new members. Uh, so that'll be uh, be all set there. Um, we will. Um, we were intending to have a, our membership meeting uh, as a part of the foundation annual meeting in Luxembourg. Uh, we will hold a membership meeting via a webinar uh, so that we can have the same thing happen amongst our members, uh, even though we can't meet. Uh, physically in the same place. So we'll be scheduling that as uh, one of the key things that we're doing uh, over the coming weeks uh, to make sure that we can uh, meet the goals of the membership. So everything about the membership nomination election process will continue on schedule uh, and we will have a membership meeting uh, sometime the, I think the week of the 21st uh, of October. Uh, I think you had a slide on partnership, Rudy? Yeah, there you, yep. There you go. I think I'm on a slow connection. Um, I just want to give you a quick update on the on the partnership program. Uh, uh, partners uh, who have been, you know, key sponsors of the foundation for the past, uh, the Transmart Foundation for the past four years, um, have been uh, very nicely uh, stepping up and continuing to participate in the in the foundation. That's a great thing. Um, so we have a number of key uh, opportunities we're putting together for the partnership program. Uh, four things uh, we are convening. Our uh, business advisory board, and uh, for those who are, are, are interested, we have, uh, have that working forward. Um, we will be convening uh, at every in-person board meeting uh, uh, the evening prior, a board of directors dinner in which uh, members, uh, our partners are, uh, are invited to join, uh, and that will be, uh, be happening again at, at every in-person board meeting. So uh, lots of things moving forward on that. We have a, a number of new partner uh, companies joining from the ITB2 Foundation world. We're pretty excited about that. Uh, and we see a lot of momentum growing in this space. So uh, we have offered uh, for, for those efforts that uh, are joining new, uh, if they join by the end of September, 
uh, that we will give them a, a one level upgrade for, for joining. Uh, that's something that a number of companies have taken advantage of. And uh, I want to just make sure that if, if, you're, if your company is interested here, uh, we have until the end of September to make this happen. So, uh, you know, please contact us. Um, you can go to, um, I think the website there, Rudy, should be i2b2transmark.org slash partnership yeah. uh, on the URL. <laughs> but uh, both Transmark Foundation and i2b2transmark.org uh, point to the same website. So uh, you can use either URL. Great. Yep. Um, if there are any questions on the partnership program, you know, please let us know. Uh, you can send an email directly to me. Uh, I think we also have the email partnership at itb2transmart.org. Great. Okay. Thank you. Um, I'll just give a quick update on the, the PMC uh, committees. Again, these are the committees that, that manage the different projects. Um, right now, we have three active um, PMCs. One for Transmart, one for I2B2, and one for the I2B2 Transmart project. Um, I lead the one on Transmart. Uh, Sean Murphy leads the one on I2B2, and Paula Viak uh, leads the one on I2B2 Transmart. Uh, all these th these groups are all meeting actively and and working um, on the projects. The Open Bell um, PMC is still being put together. One of the things that we, we uh, have realized as we've started to uh, work is that there's a number of interactions between and across the PMCs that uh, have really um, brought up some, some opportunities for us to work together. And so we've now formed the PMC Council, which is the four PMC chairs will come together on a regular basis uh, to talk about um, opportunities of coordination, uh, maybe potential issues uh, across the different teams. But um, the most exciting part is the, the, the opportunity to share and work together on some design and architecture issues, uh, testing and QA. Um, uh, an interesting discussion has, has come up in terms of, for example, uh, the speed of data loading, where uh, there, there might be some um, learning across the different teams uh, that we can share. Um, so this is something that um, is, is, is very interesting for us that um, you know, we're going to have, you know, really some of the synergies that we've always that we've all seen uh, really coming together at this PMC Council uh, as we begin to work together um, across these these the different PMCs. Um, the three teams, as I say, are, are actively working uh, and meeting regularly within our groups. Uh, we're working on an overall roadmap that will cover the next six to 12 months uh, that we'll be presenting to the board <clears throat> shortly. And we will share this roadmap here at this meeting, uh, at the next meeting on October 17th. So that's the, the update on the PMCs. And there'll be a lot more uh, to, to come, a lot more detail about um, what the specific releases are uh, moving ahead and how these all fit together. Uh, and again, we're, we're very, you know, we were feeling very, very um, good about the, the progress across the different teams and uh, especially good about the interaction that we're, we're seeing now between them. Okay, so now we'll move to the um, next part of the program. Uh, let me uh, ask Diane Keo to uh, come and introduce uh, our next two speakers as we get going here. Diane, I'm... okay. Hi. Uh, good. I'd like, to, um, I'd like to introduce the next speaker, um, Janice uh, Donahill. Jan Janice is the um, release manager for I2B2. Um, for those of you who um, use I2B2, you'll, you'll know Janice because she's the person that. Um, communicates uh, to you about the releases and, and pr uh, provides all the documentation. Um, Janice and um, Mike Mendez have uh, put together a new process that really streams light, streamlines the, um, the, uh, the release process. Um, the release process can be tedious and, and, um, and sometimes painful, and I think what um, Janice, is, Janice is gonna present to you will, um, will make that a whole lot easier, so I'll turn that over to Janice. Um, looking for Janice. Diane, can you help with, I don't see her in the list. There she is. Oh, okay.
Okay, got it. I'm sorry, thank you. Okay, Janice, you should be able to open up the screen now. Sorry about that. Oh, okay. Just unmute her too, just a second. Okay, you should be able to unmute yourself, Janice. All right, how's that? Can everyone okay. hear me now? There you go. Sounds good. Sorry about. Yep. All right. Go ahead. So, I feel like phone commercial. Can you hear me now? Um. So, as Diane said, I've been working on the ITV2 for a number of years. Um. And Mike, Mike did the legwork, so I don't want to take credit for his work, but basically. As you all know that have installed the ITV2, the update process was extremely painful and that we really didn't have an update process available for anyone. Um, I think what we were continually hearing is that you had to do like almost a completely new install whenever there was a server change, no matter how minor or major it was. So what we've done is we tried to make it easier for you and that we streamlined the process. Um, so that now you don't have to do a new install of the I2B2 server when we have a new release that has server changes. You can basically update your server in as little as six steps. The reason why I say as little as is I have a note on some of the other screens that if there's a file um, that needs to be changed because either we added a new uh, parameter or something that needs your input or anything like that, it may be an additional step where you have to edit something, but that's clearly going to be noted in the documentation that we'll provide with these. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. So basically what we're going to do is provide pre-compiled jar files. It's going to be one set of jar files. It will run in JBoss or Wildfly, JBoss 7, excuse me, or Wildfly 10. So there isn't going to, you're not going to need to look for this set for Wildfly or this set for JBoss. The reason why we were able to do that is when Mike compiled it, he used JRE 7 to compile it, which allows it to still work in the Wildfly environment, even though it's not the JRE 8. Um, and the other nice thing is, regardless of whether or not you're on Linux or Windows environments, right now it's the same upgrade process. And there are some technical requirements, though. So one is your ITV2 server has to be running JBoss 7 and JRE, or you have to be upgraded to Wildfly 10 and JRE 8. Your instance, just make sure it's 1705 or higher. One of the reasons why is 1705 um, and some of the later ones, we introduced database changes or uh, some things. So you want to make sure that you're at least at 1705. Also, you can be using the VMware, so, um, the image that we provide, but that also has to be 1705 or higher. And then obviously if you installed your ITV2 server from the source files that we provide, the zip file. So these are the basic, just very basic steps of what it's gonna take now um, on a high level. Basically you're gonna stop your JBoss or Wildfly on your ITV2 server. You're going to back up your existing war directory. And then in order for this to get redeployed, the, um, you're going to need to delete your existing, the one that's currently on your ITV2 server, the ITV2 war.deployed file. And then what you want to do is in the zip file that we provide, copy all the new files into your deployments directory. And then all you have to do is just start your JBoss or Wildfly, and then you just have to log on to ITV2 web client and make sure your ITV2 is working correctly. So where do you get this? Um, basically, there's two places in which you can access it. Um, and basically this page right here, the ITV2 org software page, when you click on this button right here, it's going to bring you 
to the actual wiki. So if you're used to going to the ITV2 software page to get your software, you can continue to do that for the upgrades. Um, but if you prefer, you can also go directly into the ITV2 community wiki, um, and that will bring you to, basically if I go to the home page right here, you just come in, you go to release management, and here's where you'll see all the official releases. One of the things I will be adding to this I want to box is I want to upgrade to the latest I2B2 software. So then it will bring you down, or you can manually click on over here. This is the latest one, upgrading from I2B2 1705 to 1709. <clears throat> These are the detailed instructions for you that Mike wrote and uh, Nitsch also wrote, <laughs> Nitsch Wadanasen. And down at the bottom, but I'm gonna move it up to the top for you as I'm looking at this right now, is the zip file that will contain the jar files for you. Now you notice this one has seven steps. The reason why is there was a change in the CRC properties file that needs your attention. <clears throat> so Mike goes through on what you should do. Uh, for that property file, but looking at it, we need to add a couple more things. But basically, this is just to give you an idea of the new way that hopefully will make it easier for everyone uh, to go ahead and upgrade their I2B2 servers. Does anyone have any questions or comments at this time? Um, since we're on GoToWebinar, if you have a question, you need to raise your hand using the button or type a question in the question window. All right. I'm going to say no All one right. has any questions. I, I see That's one from... Rudy. I see one from Peter. Um, let's see. Peter says, wait. <laughs> Peter, do you want to ask your question? Where is he? Peter, can you type your question, or would you rather see unmute? Rudy, if you want to uh, to let him speak, he has to enter the uh, the pin on his phone. Oh, okay. The pin looks like it's uh, pound. What is that? Pound seven three. Pound seven three pound. Yeah. Yeah. So, Peter, if you do that, then we can unmute you. Okay, Peter, can you uh, can you ask your question? Um, sure, sure. You know, I, I know from uh, former installs, there's config files for like data source names that have passwords in them. And I, I don't think I saw any steps on the wiki on how you would um, do that. Um, additionally, you know, um, sometimes there's uh, changes to database tables. Um, some of us have uh, requirements that things belong in particular table spaces. So, you know, basically, you know, I'm not really sure uh, how you update the database um, for the underlying data that you might need. It's a good question, Peter. Um, basically, these uh, jar files I have up on the screen now, um, what the jar, what the zip file is going to contain, and it's basically all your server, um, so for, it's not going to affect, as far as I know, unless Mike Mendez can uh, tell me otherwise, it's not gonna change your database um, data source files, your DS files that are in there, because you're gonna go directly into your deployments folder and drop all of this information into it. Your I2B2 war folder in the deployments folder, excuse me. If there are database changes, 
like we've added a new column or something like that, then obviously you would be doing another set of instructions for the database changes. Okay. Plus some of the, uh, some of your .ds files are in with your deployment, but some of your database configuration files, your data source ones are in the deployments, but some of the other ones are actually in a completely different directory. Okay, well, we'll you know try it out at some point here and see how that works. And we really want everyone's feedback because obviously we can't, uh, doing this now is the first step, um, and then finding out what oddities are occurring and whether or not this is gonna work for everyone going forward or is there something else that we can do. Uh, we're gonna rely on everyone in the community's feedback on this because everyone's got different configurations Okay, um, another question. Justin Lancaster is asking, what's the cost for a public connection? Um, public connection is the ICB2 software doesn't have any, uh, it's open source and it's free. So I'm not sure what public connection we're referring to. Yeah, Justin, if you could clarify that a bit. We have another question from, oh, here, okay. Okay, I think that answered his question. And then uh, Hang Fan is asking, um, can I2B2 be installed on a Transmart server? That is a question out of my realm, but maybe uh, one of the developers or if any of the Transmart folks know. I don't know why not. Um, um, I, don't, I don't either, but I'm not the, I don't wanna misguide someone. I would jump in and say that uh, one of the key things that we're working on, in fact, we have a PMC directed toward, is uh, running I2B2 and Transmart on the same database, on the same server. Uh, and that um, is, is the realm of, of I2B2 Transmart. And uh, I don't know, Diane, if there's anything you, you can add to that, Mike, but that's Mike certainly Mendez. a project that we're working on. Yeah, I'm, I'm good at Mike Mendez. He, I think he may have, would like to say something? Uh, yeah, Mike? can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Okay, yeah, you, you can definitely run Transmart and ITB2 on the same server. Uh, you just have to make sure that the ports aren't conflicting. Um, and the other thing to add is, uh, granted most of the time when we're doing the upgrade, it's mainly the jar files that are being changed. In the last release of 1709, we had all the work that Laurie Phillips did on the OMOF. And that's why if you look on the screen, you'll see the configuration, CRC app, CRC, dot properties hyphen 1709. Um, I put the version number there so you don't act, so users wouldn't try to copy that file and replace the existing one. Uh, I want them to look at the file and realize there's one line in that file. Most of the time that one line should be sufficient and you can just edit with the, whatever type of uh, editing tool that you uh, like to use. Edit your existing property file and then put that line in. Uh, in future versions of ITB2, we'll have configuration changes and we will have database changes. Uh, database changes will have something called like maybe database um, slash and then which database it belongs to, whether it's the PM, the CRC, the ontology. And then in there, there will be detailed upgrade instructions of how to uh, update the database. Uh, we've, we always add stuff. We never like remove stuff from our database. Uh, for example, a QT uh, query breakdown table. We'll, we will never rename the name like uh, name into something else. We'll always add stuff, add columns. Uh, so I hope that clarifies some of the questions. Okay, thank you. Um, and then uh, Matteo Gabretta just pointed out that they will have, there, there will be a Biomaris and the Hive joint presentation at the uh, Paris meeting uh, and uh, about running the two platforms on the same database. So it's a commercial for coming to Paris in two weeks. Okay, that's all I see. Um, I think we can, well, thank you, uh, Janice, that was very nice. Uh, you, you, there are a number of, uh, Comments in the in the set in the comment section, uh, thanking you for uh, this work. Um, 
So that, that's great. Thank you very much. Thank you. I um, turned it back over to you. Yeah. Okay, well, I'm turning it back over to, to Diane to introduce the next speaker. Hi, I'm very pleased to um, introduce Griffin Weber. Griffin um, has been working with ITB2 since um, the inception. Um, he's done a lot of great work around this. He, um, he has a faculty position at Harvard Medical School, working uh, um, in the Department of uh, Biomedical Informatics, and also runs the, um, the research informatics group at Children's Hospital in, in Boston. Um, Griffin was um, scheduled to give this talk in, in June, but had a, an emergency appendectomy the same day as the talk, and mm -hmm. since there has delivered his second child. So he's he's had a, a, a busy um, year so far, so I'm thrilled to, that he's able to join us. He is going to, he's done some really interesting analysis on um, publications that have cited ITV2 at Transmart. So I will let him, um, I will let him uh, give his presentation, thanks. Okay, Griffin, you should be able to get the screen and I've unmuted you. Thank you. Um, yes. Checking sounds this, you can see my screen and hear me, okay? Yes, sounds good, yep. Okay. Perfect. This project came about from a conversation I had with Diane Q a few months ago when we we're talking about measuring the impact of ITV2 and Transmart. So uh, I, one of the research areas I do involve bibliometric analysis. We, my lab has local copies of databases such as Medline, Scopus, and Web of Science. We want to look at uh, uh, different kind of publications that cite or mention ITV2 and Transmart. This may not be a very good measure of impact of ITV2. I manage ITV2 at Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center. We've had um, over 500 users run thousands of queries. I don't know if any of them actually cite ITV2 within their publications. So um, keep that in mind as I'm going through the, this. This is an impact on the scientific literature, but uh, ITB2 and Transmart may have much bigger impact in other ways. Um, uh, this is, uh, will be a fairly quick talk. This is in a really in-depth analysis. This is basically going through finding ITB2 and Transmart publications and some general uh, bibliometric uh, statistics about them. So the methods here for ITB2, I searched um, PubMed and PubMed Central. PubMed Central, you get access to the full text that mentions ITB2. Um, I also searched my local databases for this. I found 296 publications that actually cite the 10-year um, NIH grant that funded ITB2. Um, there are another 842 articles that mention ITB2 somewhere, either in the text, abstract, title. Um, combined, you have 983 distinct articles. Um, there are another 1,061 articles um, that cite uh, one of the uh, ITB2 publications that appear in a medical informatics journal. What I don't count over here is uh, if it was a publication that cited a clinical study in a cardiology journal, for example, that happens to mention ITB2 there. Um, so these 1,061 are things that are citing um, really directly sort of the informatic software or tools related to it. Transmart, I had less success at finding publications. I found 54 that mentioned it. I do not know if um, it, there really are fewer Transmart publications or if I'm searching the wrong way. I'm not from, as familiar with Transmart as I am with ITB2. I don't know if there were uh, grants or other things that may be better ways of searching for Transmart. Um, I, the analysis I use is based on a set of free bibliometric tools that my lab developed at the URL at the bottom of the screen. So if, you're, if you like the different kinds of analysis I'm gonna be showing here, but you have a different grant you wanna analyze, you can go to this website and uh, plug in the list of publications. So those thousand ITV2 publications, um, I wanted just to get a sense of what they're about. So I did some spot checks. And to me, there seems to be about four categories. Uh, one are publications that are informatics publications directly related to ITV2. So I pulled a random one out here. Title is Apps to Display Patient Data Making Smart Available in the ITV2 Platform. So this is 
uh, a, a informatics paper directly talking about software that's using the I2, I2B2 platform. Um, the second type of paper is clinical research that leverages I2B2. This is a study at Harvard, uh, lipid and lip lipoprotein levels and trend in rheumatoid arthritis compared to general population. This is one of the uh, related driving biological projects that were associated with the original I2B2 grant. Um, they're doing a clinical study, but they talk about using I2B2 as part of this research program. Uh, and then there's a third type of study where uh, it's an informatics study. Um, uh, it's not building on I2B2, but it's referencing I2B2 for one reason or another. So this paper uh, it talked about Stanford's STRIDE program, and they compare their website to the I2B2 platform, though uh, they have a completely different software program that they, they use. And there may be some others that are mis, uh, misclassified that um, probably wouldn't be counted as I2B2 publications. It's hard to even know this. I'm kind of leaving that category there. I'm not sure about it. Um, I, I put this slide up here. I don't know what the overall value to the foundation would be of going through these thousand publications and really classifying them along these three categories. There may be other categories, things that are using ITBT for genomic studies, GWAS, uh, things that are into shrine or federated networks. Um, if there are people that are interested in helping subclassify these, manually go through these uh, to try to figure out more about what all these I2B2 publications are about. Let me know if we get a big enough number of people, we may be able to divvy up work and actually go through this. Um, but the rest of this talk is just sort of treating all these publications as one um, uh, corpus of, um, of articles without sort of further um, subdivisions of them. So these are the number of I2B2 publications by year. Blue is the ones that are directly supported inside the I2B2 grant. The yellow ones mention I2B2 somewhere in the text. And the green ones are things that cite um, uh, I2B2 publications. The I2B2 grant ended in 2014. And as you can see, once funding ends, the number of publications start to drop. I don't know what the kind of steady state will be on this, but you can see. Uh, uh, 2015 was sort of the peak, and it's been falling since then. These are the Transmart publications by year. They started picking up in 2013. Uh, 2017, remember, this is a, this slide was created back in the summer, so it was just only, uh, it's only reflecting half of the year. This is a breakdown of I2 publications by field. Um, this, this is a technique that's usually based on uh, Journal article, uh, the journal titles. So National Library of Medicine classifies all the journals in PubMed along these broad subject area um, categories. So the I2B2 publications, a thousand or so of them, more than half are in medical informatics journals, um, followed by general medicine and computational biology. I'm pointing out, look at the uh, the ratio between medical informatics and computational biology here. We have almost 600 medical informatics to 74 computation biology. Um, when we switch over to Transmart slide, you'll see a big difference there. There, the computational biology and medical informatics are almost the same. Um, there's a long trail. Uh, there's ITB2 has had impact in lots of different types of fields. So uh, most informatics grants, you'll see informatics publications, but uh, almost every uh, field in medicine is um, represented here. These are the fields citing I2B2. Uh, again, medical informatics is near the top. Things that uh, pop up here that weren't so much on the other slide, once you get past um, informatics, medicine, computational, and general science, you have neoplasms, radiology, diagnostic imaging. Um, these were on the other slides, but in single digits. Um, there are a lot more in, in this class of cancer studies and radiology that uh, mention I2B2. Okay, the Transmart by field, as I mentioned, um, medical informatics and computational biology, they're almost equivalent here. This may be reflecting sort of the different use cases of Transmart versus I2B2. Uh, this slide is referring to citation impact. Um, 
one way of measuring impact of an article is to count up the number of times it's been cited. Um, there are a lot of problems with that, and usually we uh, normalize it by comparing a journal article to other similar journal articles, either in the same journal, the same publication year, or journal type. So you get a uh, actual number of times cited compared to an expected number of times cited compared to similar articles, and that gives you um, a fair estimate of how much this paper had an impact compared to what it should have. Um, first thing I'll mention is team size. Uh, the article, the ITV2 articles have 6.6 authors. Um, other articles in the same journals and years have 5.3, so there's more than one additional author per article. This is important because there's a linear relationship between the number of authors on a publication and the number of times it's been cited. So some of the uh, um, the high number of times ITB2 papers have been cited will be uh, due to just the additional number of authors on those papers. Um, but when we look at citations, that's, that doesn't fully explain it. The average uh, ITB2 article, if you remove self citations, still has 7.6 citations. Um, this is compared to 4.7 in other um, articles in the same journal and year. So there's about 60% more citations than you would expect for ITB2 publications. The table at the bottom is a breakdown of the top journals ITB2 publications in, are in and what the ratio of actual versus expected citations are. So 175 articles appear in the journal Medical and Medical Informatics Association. 100 appear in AMIA um, symposium proceedings. The, uh, the ITB2 um, uh, abstracts and AMIA proceedings have 2.787 more times citations than other um, uh, abstracts in those proceedings. So, so there's, I'm going to the AMIA uh, meeting this fall, and um, the I2B2 um, uh, talks there from the citation counts have uh, been among the more impactful of that, those conferences. These are the top grants cited by ITB2 publications. Um, ITB2 publications, of course, cite the ITB2 grant, um, but uh, second to that is Harvard's Clinical and Translational Science Center. And then the other Brigham Women Hospital grants here, BWH, reflect uh, in part a lot of the driving biological projects that collaborated with ITB2. So these are grants that are funding research that used ITB2. And then there's a natural language processing um, grant uh, through SUNY Albany that uh, is in this list. Uh, this graph um, is sort of built off of the GWAS or FIWAS typed graphs that on the x-axis represent broad subject areas. So it's kind of like a DS WAS graph that's looking at the bibliometrics distribution of um, uh, of ITB2 publications. These, each of these uh, 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 vertical bars here are reflecting different subject areas that uh, the ITB2 publications are in. I broke this out by, these are publications by people who are directly involved in the ITB2 grant. Um, the, uh, the vertical bars with the red uh, squares on the top are bars where the majority of people who contributed to that bar are from the driving biological projects, and the blue diamonds are from the actual informatics staff on the grant. What you see here is that um, the informatics people published in medical informatics uh, journals, and also statistics journals, and then the driving biological project investigators uh, publish in many different types of areas. So this is a key thing about ITB2. It wasn't just Informatics people included clinical researchers across a, a large variety of fields. Vertical axis is the percent of uh, articles in PubMed. So the collectively, the informatics team on the ITB2 grant published a quarter of one percent of all medical informatics um, uh, journal articles in PubMed, which is quite a bit considering just the, the small size of the group and. Uh, uh, there were a number of other uh, fields I said represented, including critical care, genetics, there's a big rheumatology and pulmonary 
um, component to the driving biological projects. And finally, this is a co-author network diagram of the people who are on the original I2B2 grant. Um, it could have been where you had two clouds over here, one cloud with the informatics staff and a completely separate group that had the, um, the clinical researchers, um, but it wasn't like that. We were a very integrated team. The black dots represent the informatics staff. The different colors represent the staff from the different driving biological projects. Um, each of the different clinical researchers were co-authors with multiple informatics uh, researchers. We think that this was really important reason um, why I2B2 was successful. Uh, we didn't develop the informatics in isolation and then hand it off to the clinical researchers. We were all very involved with the uh, um, clinical research studies and that fed back into the development of I2B2. So that's all I have. As I said, let me know if you're interested in taking a deeper dive into these publications. Um, there are a thousand or so of them that can benefit from different kind of classifications so we can really understand what's going on. And, and this article is understood better the impact of IQ to my friends. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Griffin. Um, any questions for Griffin on his work? Can you can uh, I have a quick question. Yeah, go ahead, Keith. So there, there was a slide showing a graph of citations by year uh, that had a peak around 2015 or so. Can you pull that back up, Griffin? Yeah, yeah. that one. So, so this is I2B2 publications or citations? So the, the blue one are publications that cite the I2B2 grant. The yellow okay. one are publications that talk about I2B2. The word I2B2 appears somewhere in the text. And then the green bars are publications that cite informatics articles talking about I2B2. Okay. So so this drop-off then in 2016 and 2017, well, 2017 is not done, but it is actually real. It's not a, a, a uh, an artifact of, of basically publications citing papers you know, increase over time. So this is the actual papers themselves, not citations, right? Like okay. The blue one, once the grant ends, you know, you would expect that to drop because the, it isn't, the ITB grant is no longer funding the research. So the, the drop in the blue is sort of what you would expect. The yellow one maybe as well. The green bars may be actually getting bigger. As you said, uh, um, sort of m more things may be citing this. Um, there's sort of a little bit of a delay between when the initial publication literature cites it. Yep. Okay. Um, uh, that's very nice. And I think it also shows the, the need for support to continue things moving forward. Um, did you have a list of, of the, the most highly cited I2B2 papers? I have a spreadsheet, um, Diane. It lists all the different um, articles and I have all the data about them. I know the uh, yeah. there was I think a 2010 paper talking about the ITB2 architecture, which may be the most cited one. Um, but I, I have the citation counts for all of them. Okay, that'd be great to see as well as which papers were the most impactful. Yes. Great. This is excellent work. Thank you very much, Griffin. I, I really like your presentation. As I said at the beginning, you know, this is not counting all the people who use ITB2 and publish things without citing ITB2. And um, I don't know, I, I know at Beth Israel, I don't, I don't actively ask investigators to cite the ITB2 grant or the publications. It's something we never really thought about before this. I don't know if there is value of, uh, of sites um, putting things on the ITB2 query tool that says, if you use this in your paper, please include this citation. Uh, I don't I don't know how we a good way of actually tracking impact other than what I have here. Yeah, I think that's a really difficult problem. I think it is very useful to have some notification in the UI, just you know, so people notice. But but I think in general, you know, a lot of people that are are using the you know the applications are not not necessarily citing the the platforms. I, yeah. I don't know what the solution to that is either.
Okay, um, I don't see any other questions. If anybody has like to raise your hand or type a question in the window. Um, and then um, not just for Griffin, but anything that we presented today, if anybody has any questions or comments, certainly entertain those now. Okay, I'm not seeing anything. I, okay. I think, Rudy, okay. one of the good okay. things that yep. Griffin points out here that I, I would just like to emphasize is I think that, you know, for open source projects in particular, having some metrics around impact are, are very important. And uh, one of the other open source platforms that uh, that we've worked with here at the foundation, Arvados, you know, has, has a means of tracking things to keep people register their, their software in order to be part of a federation. And I wonder if there are ways for us to, you know, in a dedicated way, as part of our efforts, you know, keep some better metrics of the number of people that are using the platform, how much it's used, um, uh, you know, the, the number of installations, uh, things of that nature. It just, yeah. I think having that information, you know, as as Griffin has shown here by publication, uh, but even having some that are software reported might be very, very useful. Yeah, let me suggest that that's something the PMC Council should really take up because it's something that we've talked about in Transmart a number of times and, and really not come up with a, a good conclusion, a uh, good solution. So, um, yeah, I think that's good. I mean, I think at least these are, you know, these are places that we know are using I2B2 or using Transmart. You know, so these are all positive. Well, what it isn't, it, it's not complete, right? So these are certainly places, though, that are actively using it since they're publishing on it. Um, I think we can make it easier to have them cite the, the different platforms by, you know, offering, you know, good um, good references that can be cited. Um, and, you know, I think I'd like to work with Griffin a bit, you know, because I think there are a number of the, the key papers about Transmart, for example, that he could add into, you know, his query. So uh, we'll, we'll work on this and try to maybe get, a you know, a, another, another um, collection of the data. Okay. Uh, let's see. I'm going to take the screen back again. And so um, if um, uh, there are no other questions, I think we'll wrap up today. Uh, again, uh, thanks to the presenters um, for the, the great information. And uh, thanks, everyone, for joining. Uh, our next community meeting will be uh, in October. And uh, we will uh, we'll talk to you then. Thanks, everyone.